This is an example of creative nonfiction or literary nonfiction. I wrote it a couple years ago. Um, I always feel it's important that teachers should do what they assign their students to do, so I wrote a creative nonfiction paper. I think it might be helpful to sort of communicate some of the things I recall of the process and what I was trying to do as I talk through this as an example of this kind of genre that that my students will be asked to do. So here it goes. I sat down to write one of these things or at some point I was thinking about what shall I do and it was one of these questions that came across my mind a whole bunch of times in the past. Um, is it ethical? Is it moral? To drink coffee? Am I hurting the world or somebody by my daily cup, three, four, five cups of coffee? I really love coffee. I had put it off because I really didn't want to know the answer, but I thought, here we go. It is a, it is a burning question that I had, so here is the result of that investigation. It occurs in three parts. Part one is about the creational goodness of coffee. Part two is about the effects of the fall on our use of coffee. And part three is sort of the redemption of coffee. The title of the paper is Coffee and Conscience. This is part one of three. And I just started with a little quote that I got somewhere about that creational goodness of coffee in this case to sort of set the theme for part one. On the eighth day, God created coffee. And I found that on a Zazzle mug um, online. And so, you know, this is a research paper. Uh, research needed to be done for it, but it doesn't always have to be these high-level academic peer-reviewed sort of sources. You can use anything to put forth your argument. Let's begin. At the farm, coffee time never varied. I'm not sure why I recall coffee time at Grandma's with, with such reverence and affection. Perhaps it was grace, inclusion in a ritual when I was too young to partake in the eponymous element. To a child, it wasn't about the coffee, but the cookies, the same cookies. Homemade chocolate chip and store-bought chocolate-covered marshmallow puffs with a drip of raspberry filling inside. I occasionally used to buy a box of those marshmallow cookies out of nostalgia, but they were never as good as their memory, and not nearly as good as the homemade ones. Coffee time was a regular and holy mystery. The conversation was as incomprehensible to me as the black stuff that the adults drank. In something as quotidian as coffee time, I experienced what priest, writer, and gourmet chef Robert Capon calls the unutterable weight of glory. But at the time, I had no idea. I'm sure I had to be prompted to say thank you before I raced outside. So I started with this because it is my earliest memory of coffee. It was before I even drank it. But my sense is, and what I was trying to convey, is that there's something special and memorable and significant about not just the coffee, but the gathering that took place around the coffee. And I had green Kool-Aid and, ch and chocolate chip cookies. It's not what it was about. It was about this group of people coming together. It was the unutterable weight of glory. What I tried to do is sort of capture the significance by using words like reverence, um, grace, ritual, well, it's a holy mystery, and then, of course, the unutterable weight of glory. So, you know, but trying to use diction like that to sort of package the significance of the memory. Now, what's interesting is I had no idea of the significance of this memory until I wrote about it, and that really is where we're going and what we're looking for is to reflect write about memories, but then try to understand what those memories meant. And I came to realize that it was grandpa and grandma and uncles and aunts and my parents and the children all running around, coming together same time every day on the farm. Um, people came in from wherever they were working and they sat down for this cup of coffee and it was great. That was what I was trying to do with the first section. The night I separate each little part with this little star. You can do all kinds of things. You don't even have to do, have to. You could do headings. You could do nothing at all. But I'm sort of laying down these little vignettes, these little pictures, these little anecdotes. Each one of them is in a bit of a different mode, 
and uh, together they sort of form a whole. So the parts sort of create something greater than, than the, their, their pieces. The coffee plant is particular as to where it grows, for it desires heat. It climbs up the equatorial mountains, where it hides in the oppressive humidity of the world's jungles. It likes rain, lots of rain. The earth and air flavor the fruit. In Africa, the seeds absorb essences drawn from rich black soil, evening fog, and very hot days. In Central and South America, mountain vistas and heavy humidity suffuse the beans with both light and depth. Coffee grown on the slopes of the Pacific is imbued with the vastness and verve of the surrounding ocean. Because of its capacity to absorb its environment, coffee offers some of the most complex and varied flavors of anything that we put into our mouth. Furthermore, all the flavor of a particular bean is present at the time of its picking. Nothing will be added, but without due care, much can be lost. So you probably noticed, as we started here, that uh, I'm doing something different. It, the coffee plant is personified, so it is particular, right? It, it desires, it climbs, it hides, and so, and it likes rain, lots of rain. And this is sort of, these are the characteristics uh, that are universal to all coffee. That, and then I make this sort of statement that the earth and air flavor the fruit. And then I go ab about giving examples of how in Africa, Central and South America, the Pacific Islands, in all these different locations, they have different environments, different air, different earth. And so the fruit is flavored differently. And this is part of the wonder of coffee. I love drinking coffees from different parts of the world and, and tasting how they're different. And, and I think it's like a bit miraculous. So I try to build that amazing quality up. There's this hint over here that we have the ability to differentiate these flavors, to enjoy these flavors. And it's almost like this beautiful and wonderful gift that is given to us by coffee and the creator of coffee. Next section. I sit watching an episode of how it's made. First the frenetic assembling of pencils, then an exposition on the processing of scrap metal, and then comes coffee. The narrator explains that coffee boasts over 800 flavor characteristics, at least double those of wine. The human senses can discern all these complex flavors. The poetic language is necessary to even come close to celebrate them. Kenneth Davids is a coffee aficionado and reviewer. His reviews approach poetry. With a few omissions and some restructuring, a poem is created. This poem is called Kenya Karatu AA by Cafea Rotisserie. Aroma, sonorously bright, lush yet delicate. Flowers, orange, nut, fresh cut fur. Flavor, a rounding hint of milk chocolate, silkily smooth. Finish, sweet but crisp, orangey chocolate. So... One of the things I did on my research is I went onto my television and went to the on-demand section and, and I searched coffee and then I hit record on everything that was there. So, uh, there was a Simpson ep episode, a South Park episode, there was documentaries, and then there was this, this uh, episode of how it's made. And I thought, this quote is interesting. Coffee boasts over 800 flavor characteristics, at least double those of wine. And that, it blew me away. Because you have all these guys running around the world getting all uptight about wine while well, coffee has, has doubled the complexity. And the beauty of it is we can taste it all. This Kenneth Davis, he's a guy that does taste it all. So I went to his website. He does not write poetry. He writes blogs and reviews. So what I did is I took words out and restructured them to look like a poem. What this is, is called a found poem. It's when you find a poem within the text of another larger text, in this case, a, a review of coffee. Students can create a found poem in here and uh, integrate it, hopefully not like, and here's a poem I wrote, WAP, but use a poem for a particular purpose. So what is this purpose here? Poetry is, trying, is using words to say what cannot be said. And so when, whenever you're writing one of these things and you go, hey, this is, I'm at a point where I'm trying to say something that can't be said, that's when you put in a poem. The flavor is extracted from the extraordinary beans by various methods. 
The most common in coffee houses is the espresso, brewed by forcing a small amount of nearly boiling water under pressure through finely ground coffee. Then the human creator fulfills his mandate to innovate. The variations to the making of an espresso include Luongo with more water and Ristretto with less. You can add water to make an Americano, steamed milk to make a latte, lots of steamed milk to make a macchiato, and equal parts espresso, steamed milk, and froth milk to make a cappuccino. Each of these vintages has variations as well. For instance, a cappuccino can be dry with less froth milk and no steamed milk at all. It can be a mocha with chocolate syrup and breva if it's made with half and half instead of whole milk. All of the above can be upgraded to a double, two espresso shots rather than one. Further, a plethora of syrups, flavorings, and spices can be added. Chocolate is the most common, either sprinkled on top or added in syrup form. Other favorites include cinnamon, nutmeg, and Italian syrups, and nearly any alcoholic beverage, and it need not be hot, but had warmed or even iced. I try to write it with densely packed um, just to give just to give the idea of all the variety just to sort of and I try to read it that way too. This was a very difficult paragraph to write. I I did all the research and I knew what all these things were and I sort of knew what I wanted to say. Then I then I chopped and pared and stitched and chopped and and I boiled it down to and replaced and try to make it so that it was just as dense as possible so it would have all the complexity, but but sort of be simple to read, and uh, and and that the the style and the structure of it would emphasize the the tremendous variety that we have in the kinds of coffees that we drink. Then new section, and the next sentence starts with Starbucks has over 170,000 beverage possibilities. You see how that line relates to this paragraph, but it also relates to the story that's coming up. So let's read that. Starbucks has over 170,000 beverage possibilities. I was standing in line to order an Americano. In front of me was a young man casually dressed only in black and white. His track pants were black with white stripes. His jacket was black with white sleeves. His backpack was black with white detailing and his shoes white with black detailing. Bracelet, black, earbuds, white. From his position in the line of customers, he was riding on the side of a Starbucks cup white, with a pen, black. With the flourish of a calligrapher, he wrote something in every one of those instruction boxes except the one labeled decaf. He passed the inscribed cup to the barista. They let you do that? I asked. I work here, he explained. It looks complicated. May I help you? The barista asked me. 16 ounce Americano, please. Would you like room for cream? No, thanks. I took my coffee, and the guy in the black and white was still waiting for his. Such extravagance takes time. I asked him if he could write his recipe on my cup. He did so gladly. And then, with the pride of an artist, he signed his masterpiece, Scott Hancock. Did you invent this drink, I asked? He nodded proudly. Three days later, I tried Scott's masterpiece. How could I not? I will stick to my simple Americano. It was good, but I will likely not order it again. It came up on my bill as a macchiato. I like my coffee very hot, but this one was served at only 140 degrees. It was also too sweet for a guy that drinks his coffee black. I don't ever take milk, let alone soy milk. I think it was the soy that offered an aftertaste that I just didn't like. I momentarily tasted the espresso, but it was distant and quickly subdued by the milk. This is a true story. So what happens when you're writing an article? You've got this thing percolating in your mind. You're recording things off of, off of your on-demand on your television. Also, when you're drinking coffee, you're paying attention to what's going on around you. And I saw this guy, and he was wearing exactly those clothes. And uh, this totally happened the way I, I explained it. I never would actually sort of talk to a guy like I did here. But because I was writing this paper, I thought I had to. <laughs> I was interested. Maybe there's a story here. And it turns out there was. But the point is, well, what is the point? It starts back up over here. There are, there probably are more than 170,000 beverage possibilities available at Starbucks now. When I wrote this paper, that's how many there were. I drink Americano plain. He doesn't. He drinks this. Like two very different people. I did have a section in here how I was dressed. I was wearing... 
um, flip flops and and uh, cargo shorts and a and a over worn t shirt. This guy was way more fastidious than I've ever dressed in my life, except for maybe a wedding that I was in. So we're very different people, and we have very different tastes in clothing, certainly, and we have very different tastes in coffee. That's wonderful. Places like Starbucks, but not just Starbucks. Lots of places will serve you all kinds of variety to sort of that enhances this awesomeness about the variety of people that there are in the world, each very unique, which is part of the created goodness of everything. And then um, the fact that coffee can be adapted to all these different to this all, all this different uniqueness is just pretty awesome. So I move on into cultural expressions of coffee, not individuals, but cultures now. Cultural expressions of coffee add to the variety. Madras filter coffee from southern India is very different from the Kopi Tobruk from Indonesia. Oleong from Thailand is distinct from Turkish and Vietnamese style coffees, all exceptional, all brewed, and drank with unique cultural differences. The celebration of friendship and family is central to the Ethiopian coffee ceremony. In a process that takes hours, the coffee is always prepared and served by a woman or a girl wearing a traditional white dress. After she has arranged a tray holding the cups, she will roast the, the carefully cleaned coffee beans over an open fire. A nutty aroma fills the room as the stirred beans rattle against the metal of the, of the long-handled pan. The heat coaxes out the oils, making the beans shiny and black. When they start to crackle, the woman removes the pan from the heat and walks around the room so the smell of the freshly roasted coffee fills the air. Using a wooden pestle and mortar, she grinds the co roasted coffee and then stirs it into a black earthen coffee pot. The pot is left for a moment while the grinds settle to the bottom and the flavors permeate the hot water. The pouring of the coffee requires grace and skill. To further diffuse the aroma through the room, the woman pours the coffee in one continuous stream from over a foot above the small handleless cups. It falls to the youngest child to announce that the coffee is ready and to, and to serve it, starting with the eldest member of those who will partake. The coffee is drunk with plenty of sugar. The woman is lavishly praised for her efforts in producing the coffee. Three rounds are served with stories and conversation. The last cup is called Baraka, the cup of blessing. It is possible to come as a visitor to a simple peasant hut in Ethiopia and be treated to this Yerga Chefi, which is, according to coffee experts, one of the best coffees in the world. This is a short little essay. Um, lots of research here. I've never been to Ethiopia, and I've never been part of a, of a coffee ceremony, um, and that's okay. This is creative nonfiction or literary nonfiction. Everything in here must be true. So I can't say that I went there, but I can present an article based on my research. So I read a whole bunch of articles about this coffee ceremony and boil it down to these paragraphs. I start off with a bit of an introduction about how, about all these coffees are unique and wonderful. Let's look at one. So the last one. Hey, coffee time. Don, our boss, almost always barked, hey, before he said anything. I think he liked to see us jump. If we were shoveling, he'd yell, hey, and sternly and impatiently show us the most efficient way to move dirt. And if you called it dirt, he'd snap, hey, dirt is what's under your fingernails. This is soil. Until I got used to his manner, and I never really did, I always had the sense that I did nothing right. He knew we were on edge, and he seemed to derive some pleasure from it. Twice a day, he'd come up behind us and bark, hey, followed by a much softer, coffee time. When we sat down for coffee, everything changed. He told us stories about the Vietnam War and laughed at our stories about college life. The breaks were supposed to be just 15 minutes long, but if the mood struck, he'd sit there much longer. We'd never check our watches. We'd just enjoy the company of those who worked hard together and enjoyed the grace of a few minutes of holding a coffee instead of a shovel. True story. I started this section with a story about how coffee is great. And wonderful, but I wasn't a part of it, but I got a sense of its wonder and its grace around which people gathered in meaningful ways. And then when I started drinking coffee in college, this is one of those moments when uh, 
I was now participating in this. And so these two events sort of frame, and they're the same mode, both narrative modes, but they frame what's going on in between. So hopefully the structure makes sense to you. Then we start part two. Uh, part two starts also with a quote. If this is coffee, please bring me some tea. This section is about how we've wrecked coffee, um, how we've abused coffee, and we've abused the people and the parts of the world that make coffee. C.S. Lewis explores the demonic view of pleasure in the Screwtape Letters. An experienced demon, Screwtape, offers advice to his nephew, a novice demon, on the use of pleasure to ensnare a human soul. He tells him you must always try to work away from the natural condition of any pleasure to that in which it is least natural, least redolent of his maker, and least pleasurable. For when dealing with any pleasure in its healthy and normal satisfying form, we are, in a sense, on the enemy's ground. For screw tape, the demonic formula for the distortion of pleasure is an ever-increasing craving for an ever-diminishing pleasure. I first started drinking coffee in university. My mother had sent me off to school with the essentials, 15 pairs of underwear with my name written on the band with a laundry pen, and a little yellow two-cup kettle to boil water. At some point, I picked up a little jar of Taster's Choice Instant Coffee. My coffee consumption was strictly utilitarian. I drank it to stay sharp while writing papers and cramming for exams. I didn't particularly like the taste, so I drank it with lots of sugar and a non-dairy creamer. I might as well have taken no dose. Like a cup of coffee, one caplet contains 200 milligrams of caffeine, and according to the company, company's promotional material, it's much better than coffee. Fewer pit stops, cheaper than a cup of coffee on the go, no awkward ordering, conveniently keep it in your pocket or purse, and it never gets cold. For many drinkers, the attraction to coffee is the caffeine. The peel of caffeine is threefold. It reduces drowsiness by blocking adenosine, a chemical created in the brain that slows down nerve cell activity. With the increase of neural activity, the pituitary gland releases hormones that tell the adrenal glands to produce adrenaline, so that the subject is ready for fight, flight, or even a very animated discussion on the merits or absurdity of the Occupy Wall Street movement. Caffeine also increases dopamine that activates pleasure centers in certain parts of the brain. In short, it gives you a sparkle and a jolt and an ah. Father Capon is a lover of food and drink, and more foundationally, he is a lover of things. He says things are precious before they are contributory. I think he's onto something. To reduce coffee to its function as a conveyance system for C8H10N4O2 is to commit some sort of crime against this precious thing. True delight is a far more appropriate response. So you can see the tension here between the sort of the C.S. Lewis's demons and how they want us to treat this this substance. And reducing coffee as presented in part one to just this drug without pleasure, without people, that's what I'm going for. If it's caffeine you want, the most efficient coffee product to deliver the goods is instant coffee. It requires only a spoon, a cup, and some hot water. Because the process to make instant coffee creates such a poor tasting coffee anyway, cheap, poor quality beans can be used. Instant coffee production extracts twice the stuff from the bean as does the brewing of a regular coffee. From the position of taste alone, the additional extracts should have been left and tossed out with the grounds. But by squeezing out more product per pound of beans, profit margins are increased. Unfortunately, the overextension of grounds results in a bitter and aromaless product. This section is just to trash instant coffee. It's bad, and this is why it's bad. I remember the commercials for Nestle's Sunrise Instant Coffee. The advertising slogan encouraged consumers to buy this coffee because it was mellowed with chicory. Chicory is an adulterant. It is cheaper than coffee, so by adding it to the ground coffee, the price can be dropped. Chicory isn't the only adulterant added to coffee over the years. Mark Pendergrast offers an amazing list of adulterants. I suppose parsnips and pea hulls aren't so bad when one considers baked horse liver and brick dust. 
But by principle, chicory is no different than burnt rags and coal ashes or dirt and dog biscuits. The fundamental principle is the increase of profit margins. Although this list comes from the Industrial Revolution, the motivation behind the addition of adulterants to coffee is alive and well in big coffee, coffee producers today. Cheap coffee means more coffee sold, and that means more profit. This list, it's all stuff that has been put in coffee over, over the years. The best part of waking up is Folgers in your cup. I hate waking up. The thing that gets me out of bed is the promise of a cup of coffee. Because I delay getting up as long as possible, my first cup is usually at work. There we drink whatever is on sale at Costco. We've had Folgers Classic Roast with a bright green plastic container. Procter & Grammel's promotional material says that the Classic Roast is a blend of Arabica and Robusta beans for a smooth, full-bodied flavor. That little word for suggests causality, does it not? Approaches to coffee cultivation lie on a continuum between traditional shade-grown coffee and the more modern, unshaded monoculture. The first is carried out at higher elevations under a canopy of trees where there is a constant replenishment of organic material as the leaf litter decomposes. The trees are a home to an array of beneficial insects and birds that act to control potential pests. The unshaded monoculture, on the other hand, demands the removal of all organisms but the coffee plants. They are set out by the thousands in rows upon rows that stretch for miles. This method allows for efficiencies like mechanized harvesting, but it also results in an environmental degradation. Water pollution, soil erosion, declines in local fish populations due to sedimentation, and bird populations because of loss of trees, increased soil and air temperatures, and lower amounts of moisture and microorganisms in the soil. The problems that directly affect the coffee production are solved by the applications of chemical fertilizers, pesticides, fungicides, and herbicides. Essentially, two varieties of coffee beans are grown. The Arabica variety grows at high altitudes. Its beans develop slowly and are few. The Robusta grows at lower elevations. Its beans develop quickly and are more numerous. When it comes to flavor, Arabica beans are superior in every way. From a commercial perspective, Robusta beans are superior in every way. The mechanized Robusta plantations will outproduce traditional Arabica shade farm by as much as four times per acre. The result is a vastly inferior tasting cup of coffee. You can buy a three pound can of Folgers Classic Roast at Costco for $12.99 Canadian. The mode involved here is juxtaposition. In an online discussion, the question was asked, which coffee do you like best? Here's one of the replies. Well, I love Starbucks as much as the next person. The reality is I will not pay the price for it on a daily basis. Buying it in bulk for home is just as expensive. I can buy a huge container of Folgers Maxwell House for $7 at Walmart, whereas the little Starbucks bag costs the same. For many, price is a significant factor in what coffee one drinks. But the question must be asked, if I'm not paying for the coffee I drink, who is? Several years ago, I watched an animation called The Story of Stuff, narrated by Ann Leonard. She asked a question that has haunted me ever since. When stuff is so cheap, who's paying the cost? A long chain of costs connects the coffee plant to our coffee cup here in North America. Plants must be tended, fruit must be picked and transported to the processor, the pulp removed from the beans, the beans dried and sorted and bagged, the bags transported to a warehouse to rest, the rested bags must be transported to the roaster, the roasted coffee grated and packaged, and the packaged coffee transported to retail outlets. Roasted coffee costs less than 5% of the total that you pay for a latte in a fancy coffee house. If you brewed canned coffee at home, the coffee is costing you less than 10 cents per cup. If we are paying so little for the coffee, who then is paying for all that goes before? The companies that transport, roast, and package the coffee aren't paying for it. They are enjoying healthy profits. Although they have risen in the last year or two, world coffee prices are volatile and for the last decade have been very low. Low coffee prices had a lot to do with the large surplus of Robusta and poor quality Arabica being produced by huge plantations in Vietnam and Brazil. When prices are as low as they have been, farmers get less for their coffee than the cost of its production. 
Consequently, throughout the coffee-growing world, desperate farmers abandon their trees to look for work elsewhere, while their families live under plastic tarps by the roadside. Some daughters resort to prostitution to support their families. Other farmers have burned their coffee plants and replaced them with drug crops, like coca or cut. Historically, American consumers have insisted on a low price for coffee. Cheap coffee has been so important that when the price of coffee rose sharply, congressional hearings were held to investigate the reasons behind the increases. Some were blaming producers of taking advantage of the defenseless coffee drinker. The documentary Black Coffee records a speech made by congressional witness Andreas Irube. When prices spiked in 1950, he explained the sudden price rise was because of a shortage of coffee. He pointed out that most of the money Americans paid for their coffee did not go to Latin American producers, but to U.S. roasters, retailers, and restaurants. Uribe said, Gentlemen, when you are dealing with coffee, you are not dealing only with a commodity, a convenience. You are dealing with the lives of millions of people. We in Latin America have a task before us which is staggering to the imagination. Illiteracy to be eliminated, disease to be wiped out, good health to be restored, a sound program of nutrition to be worked out for millions of people. The key to all of this is an equitable price for coffee. Otherwise, you cast these millions of persons loose to drift in a perilous sea of poverty and privation, subject to every chilling wind and every subversive blast. His words had no effect. The real enemy of coffee growers, the environment and the consumer, is the big coffee companies. They provide a market for robusta beans, the production of which is not environmentally sustainable and drive down the global price of coffee. This threatens the viability of producing the quality Arabica coffees. So what are we going to do about it? That's what part three is about. And William James has given us our quote for this section. Where the quality of the thing is sought after, the thing of supreme quality is cheap. Whatever the price one has to pay for it, so part three. For many, coffee can only be enjoyed when they know that the production of it hasn't had significant environmental and human costs. To help such concerned consumers find ethical coffee, various organizations have begun to certify producers and to label coffee according to standards of stewardship. For those who want to drink coffee that doesn't hurt the environment or the people who produce it, these labels help direct them to this coffee. The fair trade label indicates that the producers and workers in developing countries have received a fair price for their coffee and a fair wage for their labor. The rap against fair trade coffee is that it is restricted to small family-run farms. And even though there are larger non-family-run farms that produce coffee ethically. Furthermore, there is nothing stopping greedy merchants from taking advantage of well-intentioned consumers by charging exorbitant prices for the coffee bearing this label. These concerns may be valid, but a third is not. The objection that fair trade coffee isn't quality coffee is misapplied. Average ratings given to fair trade coffees by professional tasters are the same as those of other specialty coffees, and they are on the rise. The certified organic label means that the coffee wasn't grown using pesticides, chemical fertilizers, or genetically modified seeds. Bird Friendly and Rainforest Alliance certified shade-grown coffee labels means that it was grown using traditional methods so that the trees on coffee plantations are preserved rather than clear-cut. The Rainforest Alliance has begun to certify coffee producers who raise coffee in areas that have been deforested if these producers are pursuing a program of returning trees to these clear-cuts and cultivating coffee in the shade. There is another way you can be reasonably assured that your coffee is produced ethically. Simply drink great coffee. The idea here is to pay a higher price for a higher quality, and by doing so, rewarding the most committed growers. Great coffee is not grown in the full sun of a clear cut and doused with chemicals. Great coffee requires great care at every step of the process. There's a wonderful principle at work here. The best coffee is produced using methods and means that respect the people who grow it and the environment in which it is grown. It is as if justice and natural law have been fused. Suzanne, a friend of mine, has visited Honduras twice in the last three years. She did so as a member of her church's missions team. She was struck by the poverty she saw there. In order to eat, entire families worked on the coffee plantations and were paid almost nothing. Suzanne believes that if the adults received an adequate wage, the young children would be able to go to school and the cycle of poverty would be broken. The missions team, believing that serving ethical coffee was essential to supporting the coffee-producing communities like those in Honduras, convinced their church leadership to switch to fair trade coffee. 
They agreed, but Suzanne now wonders if perhaps they agreed because they believed, as do the corporate advertisers, that ethical coffee was chic and would be a, an attractant of sorts. When Suzanne's church began a large building project, there was an overall increase in donations, but less was directed to church missions. Cuts were necessary. They switched to a less expensive coffee. Residents of Abbotsford, B.C., where I live, are the most generous people in Canada. Their contribution to charities is more than double the national average. One explanation is that the community is very religious. My experience with the religious community in Abbotsford is that they will, in a flash, write a check to help a school in Nicaragua or a water project in Guatemala. But all the while, they go home and make a pot of coffee from a can, not realizing how much they could help those very communities by switching to good coffee. They buy the cheaper product because they are good people with a commitment to stewardship, unaware of the global effects of their purchase habits. What about Starbucks? Starbucks has good coffee. If you are concerned with the social and environmental effects of coffee production, your choice between buying Starbucks and corporate canned coffee is clear. Buy Starbucks. Starbucks does deserve some thanks. Although it was unintentional, probably, they have helped the plight of the coffee grower. In their quest for profits, they have given us a taste for good quality coffee. When I had my first sip of Starbucks, I thought it was too strong and too bitter. By the time I finished that cup, I realized that there was much more to coffee than caffeine and a bit of warmth. I realized I loved coffee. It was Starbucks that helped me to see that coffee is more than a caffeinated brown liquid. And by introducing me to good coffee, they put me on a quest for a great one. But to whom should Starbucks be compared? If you are comparing Starbucks to a small roaster, again, the choice is clear. Don't buy Starbucks. Because there are so many good coffees to experience, it seems a shame to limit oneself to Starbucks Pike's Place blend. Further, the variation found in the coffee can be reflected in the environment we drink it in. Since when did conformism become a core American value so that the coffee shop needs to look exactly the same in Seattle as it does in Soho? Or worse yet, the same in Vegas as in Venice? On Saturday mornings, I often accompany my wife to the local farmer's market, and an excursion made much more attractive since Grabba Java sets up a booth there. Grabba Java, a small batch wholesale micro roaster, is owned and operated by David Parrott. I visited his roaster one cold November afternoon. The small black roaster squats in the middle of a room in his house. It is warm, and the hum of the fans swirl the woody aroma of the roasting coffee beans. Disheveled piles of labels run along the counter, which is shared by large bins filled with freshly roasted coffee. His coffee comes from one supplier, Organic Product Trading Company, which sources green coffee from all over the world. All the beans are both free trade and certified organic, but they are special in another way. They are Café Feminino beans. Café Feminino is a cooperative formed in 2004 by women in northern Peru who were searching to improve the lives of their families as well as to gain some control of the coffee they work so hard to produce. To sell coffee from Café Feminino, a roaster must commit to contributing to local women's shelters and or a Café Feminino foundation. Grabba Java supports both. This concept is spreading to existing co-ops in Colombia, Nicaragua, Mexico, Dominican Republic, Brazil, and Guatemala, and soon to be introduced in Rwanda. In 1999, I watched a banana mass protester heave a USA Today newspaper box through the window of a Starbucks during the World Trade Organization riots in Seattle. This attack wasn't just random window breaking, it had targeted the coffee shop. At the time, I was disgusted by the lack of respect for property and authority, but one question lingered. What are they so mad about? Since then, I have heard things, dark whisperings about coffee and third world exploitation. I worry that maybe righteous anger is the appropriate response, and I should indignantly slam my coffee cup, empty, into the bin. But I love coffee. Coffee is why I get up in the morning. It's why I can teach writing to 16-year-olds in the last class of the day. It's why I'm willing to run errands after work. But I also desire to do what's right and good. So I have endeavored here to find out if there is such a thing as an ethical cup of coffee. It turns out there is. A great one. Best served with a homemade chocolate chip cookie. You'll notice that I wanted to hook the end of my paper into the beginning. And basically this is contains the whole thesis. And you get it. I don't need to talk anymore. So the works cited page is here. Um, and 
this is um, what went into this writing of this paper. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope that uh, you learned a little bit about creative nonfiction or or literary nonfiction writing. But more importantly, I hope you learned something about coffee and that you start that maybe this essay might change your uh, your eating habits. You can find this essay in print form on uh, trentdeyoung.com. Just search coffee. Thank you for listening.